The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, MetLife Insurance Limited, ABN 75004274882, AFSL 238096, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before before making a decision. My name is Sasha Ludkovsky and I'm a former insurance advisor and founder of The Sale Agency, where I specialise in helping financial professionals transform complex concepts into engaging content. Join me and our guests as we address the rising costs and affordability of insurance and explore strategies and solutions to help your clients meet their protection needs and help you facilitate cost-effective insurance advice. This podcast is proudly brought to you by 360 Health, MetLife's award-winning end-to-end health program designed to help your clients defend against serious health conditions so they can live healthier for longer. MetLife's 360 Health provides quick, easy and discreet access to over 50,000 leading local and global specialists, including general practitioners, doctors, psychologists, specialists and mental health clinicians. Talk to a MetLife sales manager today to find out more about how you and your clients can access expert medical support and guidance from the comfort of your own home. MetLife. Life inspired by you. Welcome to episode one in our series on how to help your clients manage rising insurance costs. In this episode, we're going to dive into effective communication strategies to help clients understand their policies, their insurance premiums, and the value of insurance. To do that, I'm joined by Sandra Miller, Risk Advisor at Holstead Financial Services, and Dr. Jeffrey Scott, Head of Advice Strategy at MetLife. It'll be great to get some insights from what it's like to be in the trenches as an advisor and also the industry and manufacturer perspective. So welcome to both of you. Thank you, Sandra. I always like to understand how people got started in this profession. So, Sandra, how did you come to specialise in insurance? <laughs> it's a family business for me. So my background's in audit and then I did tax and business services. But really since childhood, I've been listening to the stories about insurance through my dad who started out in 1983. So I would hear about claims, how he would turn up at funerals. He was the only one handing a cheque to the spouse, um, not asking for medical bills, payments and so forth. So very, very old school background. Um, but but I did the sort of the accounting thing for, for quite a while. Um, but eventually in 2006, um, I finished up the tax accounting management awarding for that and joined the family business. And I've been there ever since. It's so interesting. It's it's not an uncommon story. That that's how I got started in risk advice as well. Um, so yes, not an uncommon story. But Jeff, yourself, a lot of listeners may have had the pleasure of hearing you speak before. Uh, but it'd be great to understand a little bit about how you came to the insurance industry. Uh, as a high school kid, I was I was good in mathematics, and I saw that uh, if you're good in mathematics, one of the things that you could do is become a teacher, become an accountant, or try and become an actuary. And so straight out of straight into the university, I did my mathematics degree focusing on actuarial science. And I had a, in the university I went to, had a work study program. So you worked for four months to study for four months to see until you got your degree. And two of my four month contracts were actually working for AMP over here in Sydney, Australia. So I got to fly from Toronto, Canada to, to Sydney, Australia. And I got to work for AMP and loved it so much. Uh, designed the first terminal illness benefit back in 1989 with AMP. And uh, they said to me, if you ever want to come back, drop us a line and we'll guarantee you a job. So I finished my degree and then back in 93, joined AMP for a third time. And uh, basically the rest is history and basically stayed in the industry. Now got a, got out of the actuarial teams, uh, did some a bit of underwriting, uh, did a bit of sales as well, but then created this technical team uh, when I was with another organization and uh, just loved it and loved being able to get under the bonnet and be able to assist financial advisors to give appropriate advice with regards to taxation and superannuation with regards to how to, how the life insurance basically fits into all those bits and pieces. Because I saw, I see the good that life insurance does and where other parts of the business basically says, so if you have, if you have a loan, the bank comes to you and things go bad and say, sorry, too bad, we're going to take your house. 
the investment if your investments drop, the the fund manager goes, well, sorry, it's too bad your your funds have dropped. When something goes bad in your life, we actually come to you. And if Sandra mentioned it, we come to you with a check, and we actually say to you, when things are going bad, um, here's some money to help you out and let your family maintain their standard of living. And that's what gets me so excited and allows me to wake up in the morning. So what I love about this topic is the proactive approach in, in communicating policy changes and the value of insurance to clients from the very beginning. For me, educating clients in a, in a consistent, ongoing way is is crucial to what we do. So Sandra, what are one or two ways that you use stories or analogies to make complex ideas simple for your clients? It's everyone's familiar with insurance. So that is at least a starting point. Everyone knows about home insurance, car insurance, fire, flood. So that that's a starting point. I don't go into all the intricacies of insurance or ownership structures and step to level premiums because it's overcomplicating it. And if you go too much into the detail, no one's going to be interested. What people really, really want is when the proverbial hits the fan, what can I do to ease that pain? And that really is what insurance is. And and I fall back on stories. I've got plenty of stories. So it's really about what do you want if you are sick, can never work again, if you suffer a, a traumatic event, cancer, heart attack, cardiovascular, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We all know that. And it goes back to what you want and talk about what people want. We have a needs analysis, but it's also about what you want, not just what you need. Sure, you want to pay off the mortgage, but you also want to have holidays, have a comfortable retirement. If you focus on what people want, they're more inclined to be interested in the discussion. And it sets you up later because when you will get potentially any objections to the cost, you can tie it back to what it is that you told me you wanted. So what are we going to cut out here then? That's part of it. When I, when I, when I think of this, I actually flip it on its head because what I'm actually taught when I sit down and often I'll be with advisors in the week, in the week they'll often have conversations with the clients. And my starting point is there's a chance you don't need life insurance at all. And the client's eyes light up and they go, really? I go, yeah. You, I said, because realistically, if you have so much money that you have no debts, you can maintain your current income stream, you can maintain your standard of living. So let's say that I won the $40 million Powerball last night. If I had been that person, then my need for insurance is eliminated immediately. If I still, if I haven't met my retirement goals, if I still require an income to maintain my standard of living, if I still have debts, then I probably need insurance. And so when we come back to what insurance does, fundamentally, whether we're talking about death, whether we're talking about life cover, TPD cover, or trauma cover, or income cover, insurance does two things. It either eliminates debt or it creates an income stream. That's it. Now, how we how we actually put the jigsaw pieces together to actually bring that together and do that, then that's great. Now, if a person says, well, what if I don't have insurance? Then you start talking about the alternatives. Do you have accumulated savings? Do you have retirement? Do you have friends or family who can help you out? Could you rely on the age pension or could you rely on disability support pension? And once you start looking at the alternatives, and Sandra's right, there, every time the person says, I can't afford it anymore, then the question is, okay, can you rely on the alternatives that are available to you from a risk management perspective? If the answer is no, then we go back to, okay, then insurance becomes the most cost-effective strategy for you to manage this risk. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. And Sandra is absolutely right. Understanding about step premiums or level premiums, inside super, outside super, what the sums insured are, which company you're going to choose is irrelevant. It's getting back to first principles. And first principles are, if I if I don't need the insurance and I could maintain my standard of living, great. If we don't want insurance, then what are my risk management alternatives that I can rely on to help me through the situation? And that's ultimately that that balancing act. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's some really, really valuable content in there. And I guess speaking of value, I mean, we're talking about how we can communicate what insurance is and what insurance does to a client. Sandra, how how in, in your business and in the way you work with your clients, do you really communicate 
the ongoing value of insurance. So the client takes out in year one and they're all like, yeah, this is great. What about that ongoing every year? This is the value it provides. How do you have those conversations with clients? Well, just continuing on from what Jeff was saying, you need to remind clients that of what, what the insurance is doing because the cost of the insurance needs to be reframed from being a discretionary spend to being a non-negotiable spend. Because when down the track the prices are increasing, I can't afford it anymore, I'm thinking of cancelling it, reducing it, whatever, what you're spending has to be not negotiable. You've got other costs, your Netflix, your eating out, those sorts of things. And and they're great and they're, they're also for the now, but really what's underpinning all of that What's your safety net? It's your insurance. Without your income, you can forget about Netflix eating out the holiday. More seriously, you could lose your house. So it really is about reframing it as a not negotiable spend rather than a discretionary spend. But once you put it in that bucket, it's not negotiable. Like my mortgage repayments, like my electricity bill, and so on and so on, um, it's a you need to reprioritize your spending. Maybe you don't need six streaming services, just saying. <laughs> no, I love I love that. I think that you just hit the nail on the head by the concept of reframing. And I know that, you know, Jeff, you've got a you know a long history of understanding, you know, heuristics and consumer behavior and that sort of thing. So I'm sure that, you know, really fed into, into your interest areas. I mean, is there any other um information you could add to that or to help our listeners understand how they can actually take that step to reframe for clients? There's there's a couple of things. One, I always come back to when I look at death cover in particular, what legacy do you want to leave your family? Um, and if you want to set them up so that, to make sure that they get to maintain their standard of living, even though you're not there, then having death cover in place is essential. The second part is what's your most valuable asset? What's the most valuable asset that you will ever have? And it's your ability to generate an income. And again, when you take a look at, okay, how much are you earning now? And you multiply that by the number of years you have to age 65 or age 67 and start getting that multiple effect to say, okay, wow, I'm worth this much right now. And that's with no pay increases, no bonuses. That's what I'm worth right now. Then why wouldn't you want to ensure that most valuable asset that you have? Because everything that you do, your house that you buy, the car that you buy, the clothes that you own. Um, the trips that you go on, everything is funded by your ability to generate an income. So ultimately for me, the two most important things that you want to look after, one is look after your family with a good, with good death cover and look after yourself with good income protection cover. Now, TP and trauma cover are supplementaries and they're in their, they have their role as well, but those for me are the two most important. Once we get past that, then we start talking about behavioral finance stuff. And the behavioral finance stuff I get so excited about because um, I've read a lot about you know, Kahneman, Tversky, Airely, um, and these guys are just brilliant. And effectively what they say is that when a person pays a premium, they don't see it as peace of mind. They actually see it as a loss. Why? Because they've paid money out of their pocket. It's come out of their bank account. And what ends up happening is they see it as a loss. And so, and they say, okay, I've paid this, but what do I get in return? And what the insurance companies provide these people in the return is a PDS or a policy document or a renewal notice, which, so there's nothing, there's nothing they can play with. There's nothing they can have any use out of. There's nothing that they can eat or wear or have any enjoyment out of. So the question becomes is how do we actually get people to get over that hump and say, okay, what am I getting? Now I know that what we're doing at MetLife is we actually provide this thing called 360 health with virtual care um, that allows people to engage with their health and engage, engage with doctors and engage with, um, engage with their nutrition counseling and um, specialist referrals without actually having to be on claim. So they can do it as part of their normal situation and it doesn't, and it, there's no additional cost to the client for that. So for for us at MetLife, we, we've identified this behavioral finance issue and realized that's, a, that's one of the things. The other thing is we know for a fact that people allocate money to various buckets. Um, and that and so they, they've got money for their mortgage, as Sandra's mentioned. They've got money for their groceries. They've got money for their electricity. They've got money for their gas. And, but they also have this discretionary spend that they often don't, that they don't actually say they have money for, but they've got this discretionary spend off to the side. 
And often people have never done a budget. And so what I say to people is go back to first principles, actually do a budget, find out where your money's going. Um, take a look at your credit card statements, take a look at when you've drawn money out of your bank account um, and find out where it's going. Because with a lot of people, when they say, oh, I can't afford the insurance premium, in many cases, it's because they've allocated a certain number of dollars to various things. But this discretionary spend where they ha where it's been, where the money's gone elsewhere, if they actually say, you know, that discretionary spend, part of that discretionary spend, instead of, instead of having a discretionary spend of $1,000 a month, what we're going to do is we're going to make it, let's bring it back and make it only $900 a month. That means we have $100 a month that I'm going to use for my insurance, $1,200 a year. Now, that's not a significant policy, but if I'm a young person, that allows me to at least get some type of insurance and get some protection in place. So it's making sure that the clients are making conscious. And that's, for me, that's a lot of fun as well, because we talk about financial literacy with this. And it's for me, it gets me all warm and fuzzy inside. Yeah. And that financial literacy, you again, it's it's such a pertinent issue. I think sometimes as advisors and, and you know, working in the profession, we get our blinkers on because we just assume that the people who are coming to us probably have some sort of level of financial literacy. But broader Australia, we know there is a financial literacy problem. And early on you were saying, you know, what's your biggest asset? The amount of people who would tell me, my house or my car, no, your biggest asset is you and your ability to earn an income. And when you Deposit that to, to consumers or, or your clients, they really sometimes have to sit back and think about that and think, oh my goodness, yeah, that's really, really true. So I think that's a really nice, easy opener to start with that. When you're speaking with a client at their renewal time, you know, there we've got the insurance policy that's really a relationship between the client and the product provider and the client and you. So how much of that discussion centers on this is what the product provider does for you, this is what we do for you, this is what the product does for you? Honestly, probably not a lot. <laughs> I love MetLife 360, but but that's not why I would take out an insurance policy, right? Um, it really comes back to all the um, soft skills, okay? So really what does insurance provide you? It gives you independence, independence in what you can spend your money on. I've got a client, he had a stroke at the age of 35. He tried and tried, but was unable to work again at all. He's been on a full claim probably the last 20-ish years. And what that income protection benefit has been doing for him is it's giving him independence. He doesn't have to put on an extra jumper in winter. He's comfortable enough to turn on the heater, summertime, air con. If he's invited to a wedding he doesn't have to feel embarrassed by giving a cheaper present, for example. So it's giving him independence. It's also helping him with his retirement plans because he's sort of hitting the pointy end towards when that, that policy will stop paying. It's an age 65 benefit, but it's going to have to work beyond 65. So it's giving him that independence. So that's what insurance gives you. It buys you time as well, um, dignity. So uh, another story of a guy recently had um, a trauma benefit paid. He, he suffered cancer, had cancer, still not out of the woods. He's on medication. So he's still a client, ongoing family client. So we, we asked how, how things going and he said, um, I'm doing okay, got some medicine for the cancer. And out of curiosity, we said, how much is the medicine costing you? You can have a go at guessing if you want, or I'll tell you. Question, is it on the PBS or is it not on the PBS? <laughs> well, it depends what cancer you have. <laughs> oh, far out. And he's got the wrong cancer. Yeah. Okay, so yes, it's on the PBS, but he doesn't have that cancer, but it's pretty effective for his cancer. Mm. And it's costing $12,000 a month. Yep. Good loss of me. Yeah. Okay. That's 12 three zeros. And okay, how long are you going to be on that for? With any luck, he says about 12 months, could be up to 18 months. Now, that's buying him time because it's not on the PBS. And if he didn't have the money to fund that medical care, he just wouldn't get it. So he would not have the 
health he enjoys, the ability to live the life he wants to live. He continues to send his kids to private school. It's been a life changer for him. When I was an advisor, my frame of insurance was insurance is all about choice, independence, choice. They're, they're interchangeable terms because that's all it does. Is insurance going to make you better? Not necessarily, but it's going to solve a lot of problems that require the money along the way. And then, like you said, you've got these situations where clients might turn around and this is one of the the objections that can be common is, well, I've got Medicare, I've got private health insurance, I'll be fine. I don't need trauma. I don't need these policies. But then we have examples where the medicine isn't covered by the PBS or the medicine or for the condition that you need isn't on any sort of subsidized scheme. And this is where all of these sorts of experiences start to provide a really coherent, simple story for clients to understand the value of insurance. So, Jeff, what what are your thoughts on that? Uh, it was kind of funny because I remember I was with another organization and we had a claimant actually come to us and give us give a presentation. And we were and he was giving the presentation to our entire team. And there was about a couple hundred people in the room. And his mother and father were at the back of the room. So he was in his he was in his late 30s, early 40s, but his mother and dad were at the back of the room. And the and I basically introduced myself to his parents and he was g- giving his presentation. And the, mo- the, the mother looked at me and says, who are you? And I said, I'm Jeff and I helped design this benefit that this, that your son's been able to benefit from. I said, and I said, I'm sorry that we weren't able to make him better, but hopefully the finances were able to, um, able to assist him with his financial situation. And she looked at me and she was, she was a former school teacher. She looked at me and she goes, you're really stupid, aren't you, Jeff? And I said, I beg your pardon. She goes, really stupid, aren't you? She goes, you don't get it. She says, the money, yes, the money was helpful, but she said the money bought him the time that he was able to pay off his mortgage. He was able to spend time with his family. He was able to get the additional medical treatment that he required. And it gave him time to not rush back to work and actually have a proper recovery. She said, without that money, quite simply, he would have lost his house. His wife would have had to go back to part-time work. They would have had to find various ways to look after the kids and all the rest of it. And she said that basically gave not only peace of mind, but she said it saved his health and his family. She said, so you're really stupid that you think this is just about the money. And it was for me, it was it was a reality check because we sit in our head offices here in the in the insurance companies and we design products and we think all of this stuff and we think it's just about the money. It's never about the money. It's about how do we actually allow people to maintain their dignity, maintain their standard of living, and maintain those close relationships with their family by being able to recover in an environment that they're accustomed to. And again, it was a, it was a reality check from an old school teacher that again was the was the claimant's claimant's mom, but her bluntness and abruptness was like a slap in the face, and it was it was so refreshing. <laughs> They're both both really really powerful stories from both of you. Thank you so much for sharing. So, if you're listening and you don't have those stories for yourself yet because you're just getting started in insurance or something. Feel free to reach out to Sandra and Jeff. I'm sure they'll give you, uh, you know, permission to use use their stories. But I guess that comes back to this soft skills piece, right? So, what Sandra do you think are, you know, one or two ways or one or two things that advisors, you know, should consider working on for their soft skills? We talk about all these technical skills. You can know a PDS back to front, but what are some of the soft skills that you think are really valuable in our profession? I think. You need to be very, very passionate. You need to believe in the products. I know I'm mentioning products, but at the end of the day, it's a product that steps in and does all these wonderful, wonderful things. I would challenge new advisors and I would ask you, do you have insurance? Where, What personal protection plan have you got? Because if you don't have it, then I would say you don't really believe in it or you don't think it will happen to me. And I've seen it happen plenty of times to people who think it won't happen to them. What makes you so special? So you've got to believe in it. You've got to believe in yourself. 
you've got to hear the stories. If if you don't want to reach out to to Jeff or to me, and I welcome that. There are life officers that have on yeah YouTube channels or whatever claimant stories. So you don't need your own clients with their own stories. You've got to start somewhere. Start there. I think I, I agree with you, Sandra. Is that this is a job that you that it's inherently passionate, and more importantly, when I look at what life insurance does, it, it provides a social good. And the very first full-time life insurance agent in Australia, his name was Benjamin Short. Um, he basically worked as a life insurance agent Monday to Monday to Saturday, and on Sunday he was a Wesleyan minister. And he was so passionate about this that he would basically literally interchange the situation. He, and he, what he said to the males at the time, he said, for less than the cost of a glass of beer per week, he could guarantee that no orphans and no widows would ever go hungry. Now, I went back and I thought, well, he said that 150 years ago. I went back and took a look and recalculated the numbers because, again, I'm, I'm that nerdy type of guy <laughs> and said, "Does do the math still add up today? And so we, I sat back and said, well, if I went to a local pub, let's say it cost me 10 bucks for a glass of beer, um, $10 times 52 weeks is 520 bucks. For $520, could if I was a 30-year-old, could I get a decent life insurance policy for $520? A year, and the answer is actually I could. So the mathematics, even now, 150 years later, still add up. For less than the cost of a glass of beer per week, we could still make sure that no widows and no orphans would ever go hungry. Um, for me, that's that social good is still there, and that was back before there was any social assistance in Australia. Um, but even today, that still makes makes me so passionate because you know for a fact the social good that this does for people. Absolutely. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about the value of insurance and we've just touched on, you know, this affordability uh, factor. So, you know, it's it's a really pressing issue for advisors, for manufacturers right now, this affordability concern. So, Sandra, I'll start with you. Do you have any tips for advisors on how to address affordability concerns with clients? What do you do when a client comes to you and says, hey, this is it's just getting a bit much now. We know that you've sort of said, you know, you look at that long-term piece and you're making sure that insurance premiums are non-negotiable. They're no longer a discretionary expense for you. But what are some ways that you still address that when it inevitably comes up at renewal time? There are some levers that you can pull. You're right. First, first you make sure that it's in the not negotiable, but I also acknowledge that there is a cost and Costs across the board are increasing, so so there are levers that you can pull, waiting periods, maybe benefit periods, certain ancillary benefits on some kinds of policies. You you may, you know, have taken out a policy a few years ago, and back then a thirty day wait on an income protection policy was appropriate, but you've built up a bit of a buffer, so you could last four months, and I'm saying that quite deliberately because the monthly benefits paid in arrears. So you could go to a three-month wait, but you do have to wait four months. So that's a lever that can be pulled, for example, to to cut back on the cost. In general, I'm still a fan of an age 65 benefit, but they're reduced. It's not for everybody. That's just an example. I mean, there are other getting technical ways to structure it different differently if appropriate, ownership through super, which may or may not be appropriate, but certainly potentially can have an effect on the cost. Absolutely. And we do have a whole episode in this series dedicated to those sorts of levers. So I look forward to discussing that. But Jeff, what about from your point of view, either you know, from a manufacturer's point of view, what are some tips that, that you can provide our listeners on how to address client concerns about this affordability piece right now? I think Sandra hit on a lot of them, which was great. I think one of the first things is based on the client's assets and liabilities, if they've reduced their mortgage significantly, then the question is, is the current sum insured still appropriate for them? So is there potential for us to reduce that sum insured? That's often the, the first port of call. And again, it's looking at what are your assets, what are your liabilities, and how we, if the mortgage has been reduced significantly. Again, I know for a fact that during COVID, a lot of people um, dumped a lot of money into paying out. Paying that, paying off or reducing their mortgage, that's an opportunity there. Um, the other questions are, and Sandra sort of hinted at this a bit, is 
what do you, what's your sick leave balances that you have at work? What is your annual leave balances? What's your, um, what's your long service leave balances that you have uh, with work? And if that's the case, then can you actually extend the waiting period to make it longer? What additional savings do you have? Could, are there other liquid assets you can rely on? The other thing is that if you have loadings or exclusions, uh, or if you were a smoker and you've gone from being a smoker to a non-smoker, can you actually get that loading taken off? Because if you're a smoke, you go from a smoker to a non-smoker, I and mean, you've been a non-smoker for at least at least at least twelve months, then what ends up happening is that your premiums can be cut by anywhere from twenty to fifty percent, and sometimes even more. And that, and for me, if there's an existing loading or existing exclusion or a, a smoker rate put on there, and you can remove that, that's often the easiest one, and it's better for the person's health as well. So if they've had a if they've if, if they had a health issue in the past, and that's no longer there great way to help remove those remove those and that then helps make make it affordable more affordable also if there's a if there's um additional extras or you had a platinum style policy and go to a basic policy where you can maintain the same sum insured but effectively take away the ancillary benefits that's another way to make it more affordable and still meet that minimum sum insured required from mm. the client yeah excellent no all all great strategies and i think what's clear from both of your um comments is that all of these strategies rely on getting in touch with the client and having a discussion with them. If we simply let a client receive their renewal notice from the insurer and don't proactively follow that up or get in touch with them first, they're going to, in general, take the action, which is, I've got to reduce this cost somehow. So, Sandra, as an advisor, What's your renewal process look like? When are you getting in touch with clients to let them know their renewal's coming? How do you set that expectation with clients that, hey, we all know insurance costs are on the rise, but we are going to have a discussion with you about that? What's your process look like? Every year we send an email to a client with, in our template setting out their insurance program. It may be ahead of their renewal or it may not be. Policies renew at different times and so on. But always every year we we send send them what they have and we ask if they'd like a review and we set out why they might need a review. So have you have your family circumstances changed, you know, got married, got divorced. I'm not sure if we've got divorced in there, but (laughs) <laughs> but you know, have have um, you perhaps purchased a business? Have your debts gone up? Have they gone down? So we've got a few dot points, just some sort of uh, ideas for them to think about. So not just, hey, we're here if you want a review, but these are the reasons why you might need a review. And we don't frame it as because you might need more insurance. It's also because you might need less insurance. So so it's not just going to get deleted. And, oh, they just want to sell me more stuff. <laughs> it's what Jeff said, really. Maybe your need for insurance has reduced. I'd like to see that happen with, with people over time. Absolutely. And I mean, I'm Jeff, I know that you were speaking before about some of those levers we can pull to make insurance premiums you know, more affordable or for clients. But what about that soft skills? What Do you have any tips for advisors on how to manage those client expectations or set the client's expectations? I think that the thing is that if you're talking to clients on a regular basis, if you're having step premiums, the two things you know that are going to happen with step premiums is one, there's going to be an age-related increase every year. And as you get older, that step in the age-related increase is going to be is going to keep on growing and be far more significant. The other thing that's often associated with it is CPI indexation. Now, this past year, um, CPI on some policies is more than 7% because, index, because the inflation rate... Um, Looking at which quarter over the past past little while, the inflation rate has been um, between six, seven, six, seven, seven point three, and seven point eight. So there's been some people who've seen inflation, C- CPI indexation of inflation on their policies, an additional seven percent in addition to their age related increase. So if you're sitting down with a client and say, okay, we we know you're going to get your renewal notice in the coming weeks or coming months. When this happens, there's going to be two things that influence that premium. One's going to be your age, especially if you have a step premium. Second one's going to be CPI indexation. Now, when that happens, we can't do anything about your age. We can't make you younger. Sorry about that. But with the CPI indexation, the question is, do we need 
an additional 7% or 5% or whatever it is on your CPI this year. And if not, most insurance companies allow you to turn it off at least for 12 months. Some allow you to, some, depending upon the policy, you can turn it on or off each year. So the question is, if, you, if the client says, well, based on my assets and liabilities, I've already realized that I have enough insurance to get me through and I don't need it to be indexed by another 5% or 7% this year, then realistically, you might be able to say, okay, then the only index, the only increase you're going to see is an age-related increase, not a CPI increase. So it's making sure that the client is aware of this, that every year with step premiums, they're cheaper at the younger years, younger ages. And then as you get older, they're going to start increasing, especially once you, I'm now of a particular age, I'm now 55. Um, I know that my premiums are they start to ratchet up significantly after that. So it's making sure the client understands that. And it means that that, that active managing of my insurance policy with the help of my advisor becomes essential. Absolutely. No, look, all, all really, really relevant points. And I think that, again, what's coming out of what you're both saying is that the most important thing here is that proactivity, you know, getting in front of the clients, having the discussion and giving the clients the option for a robust discussion, but not just saying, if you want something, just call us, giving them the reasons, giving them something to think about to say, oh, yeah, that's me. I changed jobs this year. I got a pay rise or something like that. That's cause for a review. I think that proactive piece absolutely cannot be overstated. So, Sandra, I was going to ask, in terms of how you reach clients, what are some of the ways that you you reach out to clients? Do you email? Do you post? Are you active on the phones? Are you texting? What are some of the technologies that you use to get in front of your clients? All of the above. <laughs> um, we we email, we SMS, get on the phone. Um, we We don't run, we're a bit old school, we don't run email campaigns. It's something I'm looking at, but we're busy. So, but but every as I said, every year we email, we we follow up the email with an SMS because not everyone looks at their email or may have gone to junk or whatever. And we're also calling people, and it's at least on a yearly basis. Absolutely, Jeff. From that you know industry wide perspective, are there any technologies or processes that you've seen advisors using that have just absolutely wowed you or something new on them? I mean, AI is the big thing right now, right? Is there any anything in that space that you're seeing that's that that can really help advisors be more proactive in their client communications around cost affordability? Well, actually, regretfully, what I've found is that the advisors who do this well, it's not about the AI, it's about the personal touch. Mm -hmm. because because again whether we like it or not life insurance is still sold it's not bought the majority of people and again we, we saw this I, I saw this across the industry if a client basically goes and buys a policy direct from an insurance company no advisor involvement what ends up happening is the lapse rates of those are normally anywhere from 40 to 60 percent in the first 12 months because they they buy it on a motion and then they sit back and go oh do i really uh and then no, I'll, I'll lapse it. We're having that advisor interaction, having that personal touch where they have someone that they trust, actually part of the process, um, basically allows them to reinforce that purchasing behavior. Because almost everybody, whenever they buy anything, especially if it's a significant purchase, has buyer remorse. And that buyer remorse basically means that the advisor then comes back in. And what I've found that with the successful advisors is we know that people learn in one of three ways. They learn by audio, they learn by visual, they learn by kinesthetic. Um, the, and so by having the advisor involvement say, okay, if you learn by audio, I'm going to pick up the phone and talk to you over the phone and say, great job, well done, good purchase. If it's by visual, I'm going to send you an email or a text or something in writing that basically says the same thing or old school handwritten letter saying, great job, well done, do that. If it's kinesthetic, I'm going to send them a survey saying, what was the experience? And again, great job, well done, all the rest of it. And so what you end up doing is that by having that personal advisor touch reinforces the buyer behavior and overcomes that that basically buyer's remorse. And again, that somatic trust that the person has with the advisor um, is something that is the reason why insurance companies still distribute via financial advisors. Why? Because we know for a fact we get the best client outcomes by doing it this way. 
um, the advisors are essential to the process. And so from our perspective, what we found is that the advisors who actually get on the phone, have that good relationship, engage with the clients are the ones that basically they're one, have better sales and two, have better lapses. Um, it's, it's a win-win all the way through. So, um, and again, it's making sure that you communicate in the way that your client base or your individual clients want to be communicated with. Absolutely. And I guess this sort of comes to the, to the crescendo or the crux of it, which is for me, it sounds like addressing affordability concerns. It starts at the beginning. It starts at the beginning of a client relationship because the cost is just one objection and the cost is an easy objection when there's no advisor relationship or when there's a poor advisor relationship or when there's poor communication, when they don't, when the client doesn't feel connected to your business, doesn't know, like, or trust you. But I do think that, you know, it really speaks to that whole advisor piece of all of these issues can become potential non or minimized issues if we start at the beginning, set the client expectations, have the good relationship. All right, Jeff, we're coming to the end of the podcast. So if you could share just your number one top tip to help our listeners address affordability concerns with their clients, what would it be? For, for, for me, number one tip, do a budget. It's amazing the leakage people have on their discretionary spend. Yes, they have to pay for their mortgage or their rent. Yes, they've got to pay for their electricity bills and they've got to pay for their gas bills. Um, but the amount of money that people leak with discretionary spend, and we don't want all that discretionary spend for insurance, but do the budget first, know where the money's going. Then when the client says, I can't afford it, in most cases they can. They just don't know where that money's gone that they could use for insurance instead. And so for me, always come back, do that budget because that becomes the basis of not just your insurance advice, but also any holistic financial planning advice you give as well. Now, Sandra, your turn. If you could give us our one top tip for our listeners to address affordability concerns with their clients, what would it be? I would agree with Jeff on doing a budget. Um, Jeff articulated it perfectly. I would not be so articulate. I think the challenge with the budget is so many people don't want to look at it can't be bothered. It's too hard. It's too time consuming. So even if you just picked out a few things in what you spend, don't go and look at your credit cards for 12 months and add it all up, but just pick a few low hanging fruit that maybe is not so necessary, or maybe you can find a more cost-effective option. So certain entertainment spending, for example, Kids and family, you know, gifts, maybe to go to the library instead, free activities or whatever. So maybe if you're not keen on going to the extent of a budget, have a, find a few low-hanging fruit parts of your, your family spend and see what can be trimmed because really it's reminding a person going back to their need for the insurance and what they want. So we're talking about what we're spending our money on now. But again, without that foundation, without us being a source of income, you're not going to have all these enjoyments and luxuries in life. And you want the choice to spend your money on those those things as well. Excellent. And look, I think if I were to take a top tip out of that, for me, it's that as an advisor, we have to get good at and be confident at asking the hard questions we're not order takers, we're advisors and strategists. And sometimes that means asking some really hard questions that clients may not be prepared for and sometimes might not even like. So thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, and thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Sandra, for sharing your wisdom and your advice and your tips and your stories today. That was excellent. So stay tuned for our next episode in the series and um, we will see you then. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.